welcome to another episode of the Giants of the Faith podcast. My name is Robert Daniels, and I'm the host of this show. This is the podcast where we focus on individuals from the age of the church who've lived out their faith in a unique or interesting way. These are people who are giants in the history of Christendom, and each has earned a spot in my personal Christian Hall of Fame. In episode 32, we're going to survey the life and impact of English reformer William Tyndale. I'd always known Tyndale as the man that translated the Bible into English, but his story is much more than that. It's full of intrigue, secrecy, bounty hunters, daring escapes, and above all, a ferocious devotion to the kingdom of God. I hope that this recounting of his commitment encourages you as it did me. William Tyndale's birth date is unknown, but it was probably sometime in 1494 in Gloucestershire, England. His father's name was Richard, but his mother's name is lost to history. Some sketchy connections say that it might have been Tabitha Hitchens, but we just don't know. What we do know is that Tyndale was enrolled at Magdalen School in 1506, and then Magdalen College at Oxford University in 1508, under the name William Hitchens. He completed his Bachelor of Arts degree in 1512, and in 1515 he completed his Master's degree. 1516 saw him ordained as a Catholic priest. Once he was finished at Oxford... He moved on to Cambridge in 1517 to study theology. That was a disappointment to him, however, because he found that he was not given direct access to the Bible to study it. He first had to go through years of training by the church in church doctrine and tradition. It was around this time, however, that Martin Luther began making waves on the continent, and many of his books made their way to Cambridge. In addition, Erasmus's Greek New Testament was available, and young men at Cambridge had begun to read it. One such group of young men met together regularly at the White Horse Inn at Cambridge to discuss Luther's new theology. And this was no ordinary group of men. It was a virtual who's who of the English Reformation. Names you might recognize that frequented the White Horse include Robert Barnes, Miles Coverdale, Nicholas Ridley, Hugh Latimer, Thomas Cranmer, Thomas Bilney, and of course William Tyndale. You'll see some of these others on future episodes of this podcast, I'm sure. These young men met and read Luther with such regularity that the White Horse became known as Little Germany. In 1521, Tyndale left Cambridge, maybe with a degree, maybe not, and went into service as a private chaplain and tutor in the home of Sir John Walsh. Walsh would often host priests for dinners, and at one particular dinner, Tyndale's life's course was altered. John Fox of the Book of Martyrs, recounts a dinner conversation that Tyndale had with the visiting priest. On the subject of papal authority, the visitor said, We had better be without God's laws than the Pope's. To which Tyndale gave his famous response, I defy the Pope and all his laws, he said. If God spare my life ere many years, I will cause a boy that driveth the plow shall know more of the scripture than thou dost. Tyndale had come to realize that England would never be evangelized without scriptures in the common tongue. Now, there were English Bibles floating around. Wycliffe had translated his Bible from the Latin Vulgate 140 years earlier, but those were never technically approved for use, and the church was very hostile toward them. I mean, after Wycliffe's death, Pope Martin V had him dug up and burned posthumously, and had his ashes scattered in the river. You can't get much more hostile than that. Tyndale wanted a new approved translation from the original Greek. With that goal in mind, he traveled to London in 1523 looking for that approval. Tyndale met with the Bishop of London, Cuthbert Tunstall, who he rather naively felt surely would be open to his ideas. He was wrong. Though Tunstall had publicly praised Erasmus and had even worked with him on his Greek New Testament, he was not interested in a Bible translation that the common man could understand. In fact, It was quite the opposite. He was antagonistic to the idea. He saw what was happening in the German-speaking world with the release of Luther's translations, and he wanted no part of it. Disappointed, Tyndale settled in London for a while, earning a hand-to-mouth living preaching and speaking. Importantly, this led him to be introduced to Humphrey Monmouth. Humphrey was a very wealthy cloth merchant who had a huge fleet of ships that will come into play later in this story. Humphrey had Lollard sympathies, The Lollards were a group of sort of English proto-Protestants that were interested in reforming the church and were inspired by the teachings of John Wycliffe. Monmouth put Tyndale up in his house and he supported him financially. 
After a few months in London, Tyndale determined that there was so little support among the English authorities for a new authorized translation that he would be best served completing his work from the continent. So in April 1524, he boarded a ship and left his home country. Tyndale landed in Hamburg and traveled to Wittenberg to meet Martin Luther and begin his work of translating the Greek New Testament into English. By August 1525, he'd completed the work and traveled to Cologne to oversee its printing. Tyndale engaged a printer there and stressed the secrecy required for the project. Loose lips sink ships, they say, and unfortunately for Tyndale, someone, presumably someone from the print house, let slip that the work was underway. The news made it to the ears of Johann Cochleus, an anti-reformer who had sparred with Luther and others, who arranged for a raid on the print shop. Somehow, Tyndale was warned of the raid, and he collected the pages that had already been printed, about ten pages of Matthew, and he made a night escape up the Rhine River to the more friendly environs of Worms. In Worms, Tyndale found another printer who agreed to complete the work. A 6,000 copy run was completed, the first printed copy of the New Testament in English. In the spring of 1526, the work was complete, and Tyndale began smuggling his New Testament into England and Scotland. And how was it smuggled? Inside bales of cotton, on Humphrey Monmouth's ships. Monmouth's network of ships sailing all over the world would be the conduit for Tyndale's New Testament to reach the English-speaking world. And the sheer number of ships ensured that, even as the church and government tried to capture and destroy all copies, it would survive and flourish. In October of 1526, Bishop Tunstall, the same man that Tyndale had thought would be a friend, officially condemned Tyndale and his Bible. Confiscated copies of the work were burned at St. Paul's. It became a crime to buy, sell, or even to handle Tyndale's Bible. Men who had been caught distributing it had been burned at the stake. Even the wealthy Monmouth had been brought in for questioning. But this persecution did nothing to limit demand. People were hungry to have copies of the Bible that they could read, and they risked much to obtain them. To this point, Tyndale had been living in relative safety and the continent. But in 1528, the empire struck back. In June, Cardinal Wolsey, the Lord Chancellor of England, whose power rivaled the king, ordered the ambassador to the Netherlands, John Hackett, to demand that the Dutch track down and arrest Tyndale, who had been living in Antwerp. Wolsey also sent secret agents from England itself to try and find Tyndale and bring him to justice. Those agents failed because Tyndale had moved on to Marburg. Not content with failure, Wolsey tried again. In September 1528, he sent Friar John West to look for Tyndale. West arrived in Antwerp to no fanfare and dressed in civilian clothing. He searched the city interviewed printers and their workmen, but he still could not find Tyndale. Meanwhile, Tyndale was all the time working. He was revising his translation, and he'd also been teaching himself Hebrew so that he could begin translating the Old Testament. He moved back to Antwerp once he felt the coast was clear, and he began his work in earnest to translate the Pentateuch. When he finished the translation, he decided that he needed to print it elsewhere because there was just too much danger of discovery in Antwerp. So he gathered his belongings and boarded a ship bound for Hamburg, Germany. Unfortunately, the ship ran into a storm off the coast and it was sunk. Tyndale survived, but his translations did not. He would be forced to start all over. He made his way to Hamburg, where he was taken in by a wealthy local family with Reformation sympathies. In the relative safely of Hamburg, he began his translation anew. He worked from March to December 1529, to complete the translation of the Pentateuch, and then he sent it to Antwerp for printing, and from there, distribution to England. Now, Tyndale was doing more than just translating. He was also writing. In 1528, he published The Obedience of a Christian Man, which stressed the primacy of Scripture above the church and gave strong support for obedience to the king as God's agent on earth. Although the book was illegal in England, it was widely read and a copy of it made it all the way to Henry VIII by the way of his mistress, Anne Boleyn, who incidentally had six fingers on one of her hands. This book greatly influenced Henry and played a large part in his eventual separation from the Catholic Church and the creation of the Church of England. 1530 brought another attempt by the English authorities to bring Tyndale home. This time it was Thomas Cromwell, Wolsey's protege, that changed tactics and tried to use a little sugar to lure him out. Cromwell sent Stephen Vaughan, a Reformation-minded merchant, to find Tyndale. 
Vaughn wrote letters to Tyndale, and I'm not sure how they got to him, but they did, and Tyndale responded. Eventually, a series of secret meetings were arranged where Vaughn made Cromwell's offer. If Tyndale would return to England, he would receive a salary, safe passage, and be allowed to continue his work. Tyndale was leery of the offer. He worried that he would be arrested and the translation work would cease. He told Vaughn that the only way he would return is if the king would commission another translation to be done by someone else. Then Tyndale would surrender to whatever the king wanted. They couldn't come to an agreement, so Tyndale stayed in Antwerp in the home of a man named Points, and he began to work on a revised edition of the New Testament, as well as the next section of the Old Testament. In 1534, his second New Testament was published, with over 4,000 corrections from the first edition. But the authorities had not given up on bringing Tyndale in. In 1535, they played their next hand. A young man named Henry Phillips had been entrusted by his father with some money that was to be used to pay a debt. Rather than paying his father's debt, Phillips had gambled the money away. Someone from the church learned of Phillips' situation and offered to pay him a large sum of money if he would find Tyndale. Phillips accepted the money and he took on the role of bounty hunter. He sailed to Antwerp and began making contacts with the English merchant class there. He posed as a Reformation supporter and eventually found his way to Tyndale. He didn't just rat Tyndale out right away, however. He first befriended him, and gained his confidence. He pretended to favor Tyndale's work, but all the while was a staunch Catholic in the pay of the Roman Church in England. One evening, he came to the house where Tyndale was staying, saying that he had no money for food. Tyndale agreed to take his friend to dinner, but Phillips had set a trap. There were troops loyal to the Holy Roman Emperor waiting in an alley, and when Tyndale passed through, they arrested him. Points' home was also raided, and Tyndale's possessions were confiscated. All of them except the Old Testament translations that he'd been working on. Somehow, that was missed and was eventually published in 1537. It may be that they were in the possession of a friend. We just don't know. Tyndale was taken to the castle Vilvord near Brussels and held prisoner for 14 months. Tyndale begged his jailers for the materials he needed to continue his work, even though he had to know his life was drawing to an end. This was denied him, of course, and eventually he was declared a heretic and handed over to the secular authorities for punishment. In late September, or early October, 1536, the record isn't clear, Tyndale was taken out to be executed. His last words are reported to be, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. He was tied to the stake, and straw was piled around him. Gunpowder was then sprinkled over the straw. A rope or a chain was tied around his neck, and he was strangled in an act of mercy that was supposed to save him from the flames. Then the fires were lit, but the strangulation had not killed him. He was merely unconscious. He awoke when the flames grew, and he died a horrible death. And then, after he was dead, the gunpowder that had been thrown onto the fire to help it along exploded, and it blew his corpse to pieces. It was a brutal, brutal execution. Now, Tyndale's history is an incomplete one. We know enough to tell a story, like I've done here in this podcast episode, but many details are missing or conflicting. He lived so much of his life in secrecy that records are scarce, but we certainly owe him a great debt. His life's work, that he literally gave his very life for, was to make the Bible accessible to the common man, both readable and understandable. Within two years of Tyndale's death, Henry VIII ordered that every parish in England should have a copy of the Bible in English. Eventually, King James commissioned the authorized version, and about 90% of the New Testament of that translation was taken from Tyndale. His dedication to the kingdom of God was incredible. And that's all for this episode of Giants of the Faith. Thanks for listening and subscribing. Until next time, God bless.